Hello and welcome to Film de Siècle, the film and media channel focused on all things 90s and 2000s. This week, Seb and Ollie will be discussing... Encino Man! Hello, and welcome back to Film de Siècle, the film and media discussion channel where we talk about all things 1990s to 2000s. And we're continuing Frasier February with Encino Man, otherwise known as California Man. It's only called California Man here, and I have no idea why. I don't know, I suppose it's like the American version of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Like, British people won't know what an Encino is. To be honest, I don't know what Encino is. I, I think that it's a region of California. Um, is that right? You've seen Encino, the movie, Encino, California. Uh, well, I haven't seen it for years, and... I only uh, I was only interested in it because Brendan Fraser was in it as a kid, and um, uh, well, he was from that those mummy films. What I liked, so <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. Uh, maybe the film explains what the hell an Encino is. Encino, California. It sounds like a place. I'm gonna. It does. Like I'd believe it. I'd believe it if somebody. We're so ignorant. I'm gonna look it up. <laughs> okay. Encino, Los Angeles, California is a neighbourhood in the San Fernando Valley region of Los Angeles, California. Well, I suppose we're right to call it California Man in the UK, because we didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, true. It's very local knowledge, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but then again, you know, setting it in uh, Los Angeles, I suppose you could call it um, Venice Man, but people might think it's an Italian thing, you know. If the film is set in Encino, then why not just call it Encino Man? Like, you'll know what it is when you see the film. That's a good point. It will be an educational film because it will tell you about the place. I mean, it would be like if it, instead of the Grand Budapest Hotel, it was the Grand Eastern Europe Hotel. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't teach you anything, would it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, true. So, Ollie, I have no memories of this movie. All I know about it is what you told me before, which is that Brendan Fraser's in it and Eric Avari, who is a shopkeeper. I seem to remember one of the characters as Sean Austin, or at least it it looks a lot like him. I read the movie synopsis, and it was Sean Austin. Oh right, yeah, and and also Paulie Shaw, which I know now because I watched Futurama when they unfreeze him and he talks about Encino Man, and I can see him on the the uh, pre playing screen on Disney Plus. That makes a lot of sense. I think Paulie Shaw is an American comedian that was never really that popular in the UK. Yeah, um, yeah. I I also remember Eric Avari being in it. Yes, uh, I don't know if he was any kind of major character. Probably he, not. He but... he wasn't, but he has a line that I think is funny. Okay, well that's good because uh, Eric Avari is iconic when he's iconic. But Sean Astin, I suppose this would have been an early breakthrough role for him because the first movie chronologically. I remember him being in that did well was Memphis Bell, which was a movie about a B-17 flying fortress. What was a movie about a flying fortress? At Memphis Bell, it was um, a movie about a flying fortress. Ah, Memphis Bell. I've never heard of it. Uh, well, it's set in World War II, and Sean Astin was one of the air crew in that movie. It also had Billy Zane, so it had a few big names in it, but also a yeah. few fairly obscure names. Right. I, I think that, um, if I remember right, he was the ball turret gunner. Because his whole thing was that he had a bit of a mouth on him and he went on and on about the ladies and at the end of the day he wasn't all that. But huh. <laughs> I think he yeah. also got injured, I seem to remember, and that being like one of the big dramatic moments of the movie. Sorry, I'm spoiling a movie about Memphis Bell. This isn't good. Yeah, but Put, flag Ollie, the video for Memphis Bell spoilers. Heavy spoilers for Memphis Bell in this review about Encino Man. Yeah. Um, when was Memphis Bell released? I think 1991, 1992. That could be a film to see a movie. That'd be yeah, we could do that one. Uh, yeah. I like how this is how we pick our videos. We just talk about them and like, yeah, let's do it later. Well, that's how we ended up doing Court in Condi, and I don't regret that. So. And ironically, Encino Man. Yeah, yeah. So, Ollie, what are your memories of this movie? I remember it being funny. And I mostly remember the phrase, wheeze the juice, which I still use to this day. Brilliant. <laughs> I'm looking forward to understanding the context behind that. Oh, I was about to explain what it means. Oh, go on. Oh, go right. On. 
to wheeze the juice is when you drink directly from a dispenser nozzle. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this movie seems like it's going to have some funny moments. Uh, from what I understand of the synopsis, he's a caveman who got frozen and he gets thawed out and reintroduced into modern society. It's that kind of movie. Yeah, I, I think Sean Astin and Paulie Shaw are trying to dig a pool and they dig up a frozen caveman and he thaws out in their garage. Yeah, as you do, because, you know, you find plenty of pack ice in California. Apparently. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. What is it with this subgenre of Brendan Fraser movies where he has to be re ingratiated into society? Because <laughs> <laughs> oh. George of the Jungle as well. Yeah, yeah. George of the Jungle, that's a movie. What? What? what when did George of the Jungle come out? I think 97, 98. Yeah, that was about five years after this. Yeah, so... Obviously... Encino Man, in many ways, could have been a prototype George of the Jungle. Yeah, then again, I suppose he wants to do George of the Jungle while he still had the hair to pull it off. Yeah, I suppose. As you do. <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to this one, because this is a complete blank slate. I'm expecting a moderately funny comedy that you shouldn't take too seriously, and probably... Won't be an instant classic that you'll treasure for the rest of your life, but will be something to entertain you on a nice afternoon. I don't remember much of the humour, but that's also what I'm expecting. It's been yeah. so long since I saw it. So it'll be like a fresh pair of eyes for the both of us looking at this. Yeah. <laughs> In that regard. All right. Uh, let's not wait any longer. Let's watch Encino Man slash California Man. Could have called it America Man if they thought that we didn't know what California was. <laughs> <laughs> Western Hemisphere, man. <laughs> that would be a brilliant name for a movie. <laughs> right, let's go ahead and watch this. See you in a bit. And we've returned, having watched Encino Man, aka California Man. Ollie, did you like the movie? I did, yeah. I don't know how good I'd say it was, but I liked it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was wicked. It was a very 90s comedy. Very early 90s comedy as well. Yeah, yeah. More specifically. I don't mean this in a bad way, but it's probably the most pointless movie I've ever watched. Yeah, you you said while watching it that the entire movie is just one long non sequitur. It is. Things happen, nothing ever comes of it. More things happen, nothing comes of that. And then we yeah. just left with two hours of random... Mo- well, was it even two hours? An hour and a half of random moments. Yeah. They were funny random moments. Not laugh out loud funny, but they were amusing. It didn't overstay its welcome, though. It was exactly as long as it needed to be, I think. (laughs) Well, that's the thing. Uh, About two-thirds away through the movie, I noticed that it was two-thirds away through the movie, and I said to you, what, it's nearly over already? Yeah. Yeah. You don't feel that much of the runtime, do you? (laughs) No. So I don't think we're supposed to think about the long-term ramifications of these... Of this caveman existing in the modern day, or how he ends up being socialised. But, you know, it's a perfectly entertaining film. I actually thought that the movie would do a lot more of that. Yeah. I I don't think he's even really conquered the power of speech by the end of the movie. No, like, he's picked up some phrases, words and phrases, and a smattering of Spanish. (laughs) (laughs) Funnily enough, I think he speaks more Spanish by the end of it than he does English. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that was a very interesting movie. I don't really know what the objective was, what the character arcs was, uh, but it was alright. Well, Sean Astin wants to be popular and be prom king. Paulie Shaw doesn't care, and he just wants to chill out and have a good time. And Brendan Fraser is a caveman who is scared of the world he currently inhabits initially, and, well, has to learn to exist in this world, although that doesn't seem to occur to him. (laughs) No, I mean, one thing I do kind of like about the titular Encino Man, assuming that he's the Encino Man and not Sean Astin? I mean, they're all Encino Men, technically, because they all live (laughs) in Encino. We are all Encino (laughs) Men. Yeah. (laughs) Zeshwi Encino Man. I wonder if they're related to Florida Man. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, slightly more metropolitan cousin. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what I kind of liked about the main character is that he didn't really need to change to get people to like him. No, no. I mean, that was quite positive. 
school is a very superficial time in your life. It is. Uh, well, school popularity can be very superficial and changes on a dime. At least it did in my school. Well, yeah. our school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, school popularity was a very odd theme in this movie because there's this whole thing where Paulie Shaw and Sean Astin are meant to be unpopular kids and they're often mentioned as being the most unpopular. But just so going by superficially and by the way they are, they, I don't think they would be unpopular. I don't think they'd maybe be like the most popular kids. They definitely have their circle of friends. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I think, I mean, Paulie Shaw would probably be a bit of an acquired taste as he is in real life. Uh, Sean Astin would probably be mostly ignored or people would feel indifferent to him, I think, in a modern day school environment. If not for the fact that he's Sean Astin and therefore, you know. <laughs> I mean, Sean Astin as he was in the movie, not like modern day Sean Astin. That would be a bit weird going into a classroom and then you see like a 50 year old Sean Astin sitting there. <laughs> Why, he's a perfect um, exchange student? <laughs> I'm picturing Two Flower from the TV adaptation of The Colour of Magic just sitting in a classroom, <laughs> <laughs> wide eyed and enthusiastic. Yeah. Um... <laughs> This movie has a lot of weird plot threads that don't go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's a one where they're a bit concerned about him because he's inappropriate with women. That doesn't really go anywhere. I mean, it happens once early on. They like, I think it's implied that they learning how to behave from them. Yeah, and that joke hasn't maybe aged very well. Which uh, one? But, you know, the joke that a caveman would. It's it's not really a joke, but it's played for humour that he's inappropriate with girls. I mean, he doesn't really actually do anything. He just goes like, gazungas, and that's the end and of it. Gonzagas. Yeah, and then he mm. sniffs, sniffs their hair, and that's about it. Yeah, and oh, it did feel a bit <laughs> awkward. And no, that wasn't actually in the script. That was just him doing his Harvey Weinstein impression. Oh, God. <laughs> to amuse the camera crew. Yeah. But even at the time when uh, that probably would have been a less awkward scene in a comedy, how much mileage could you have got out of that? Exactly. I think it's deliberately meant to be awkward. Yeah, yeah. Also, there was that weird bit where during the bar scene. That's a weird scene, the bar scene. Yeah. Because they steal a car from a driving tutor and they go to a bar. They go in and there's like these... Mexican guys, I think, who know Pauly Short, or are at least friendly with him. Yeah, it's pretty vague. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know what they, whether they have any previous relationship, if at all. Uh, yeah. But they give him some tequila, and uh, then the guy says, if anybody looks at my wife or girlfriend, whatever it is, uh, then I'll kill them. And he says it in a serious way, like, okay, this is coming back later, there's going to be a big bar brawl. And that's what the struggle's going to be. And then you realise, oh yeah, he can be a bit inappropriate with women. And see, no man is probably going to look at his girlfriend and then there'll be a big brawl and a big fight. And then he goes, you're looking at my wife or whatever. And then there is no fight. <laughs> There's no yeah. fight. <laughs> I don't know what happens there. I think he's just like, yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> that was a non-sequitur yeah. of the sea. Ah. <laughs> uh. Broken up by them getting arrested. Yeah. Now, <laughs> were they arrested for stealing the car? Because if they were, they probably wouldn't have got out so quick. But also, no. if not, if not, what were they arrested for? <laughs> like, <laughs> I think they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I think at most they spent a night in the jail cell, which is what I suppose you do if they're drunk. But only Paulie Shaw was drinking, and he only had like one shot of tequila. The others weren't even drinking; they were just there. Yeah. I mean, I assume it's because they stole the car, because I can't think of any other reason. And to be fair, he was talking to the police saying, oh yeah, yeah, here's my license plate number and all that. So, assumably that's why they were there. But it's weird how everybody else in the bar ran away from the police and escaped. It's like, nothing illegal was going on in the bar that I could see. Yeah, I mean, the establishment didn't appear to be dodgy. <laughs> no, it just looks like a normal bar. Although yeah. it was shot very similarly to the bar from Attack of the Clones, actually. Although the phrase Encino comes up a lot, and you know you see Encino High School, why could so why they couldn't call it Encino Man over here just boggles the mind. You would figure it out very quickly. Yeah, yeah, like within five minutes of the film starting. <laughs> Wait, Encino is he Encino? No, that's Sean Astin. 
So All who's right. this Encino man everyone's talking about? <laughs> I Encino man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, why was everybody? Else, yeah, why was everybody else escaping the police? They did nothing wrong. Yeah, <laughs> I never all so conceited that they thought that the police were there for them. <laughs> oh. And let's face it: if there's one thing that people, I think we're the- overthinking this film. That's about to be the funny. That is about the funny caveman in modern times. Well, yes, but we're doing it for humorous effect, are they? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I enjoyed the film. Uh, I can't imagine what the critics' consensus is going to be like. Well, we'll look at that later. Yeah. It, it was a fun way to kill an hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> and the director of this movie, this was the first movie he directed, but he went on to do Miracle of 34th Street and Flubber afterwards, which are two movies that were held in high esteem in their time. I haven't seen Miracle on 34th Street. I have been in the room when Flubber was on. I wouldn't say I've seen it. It's all right. Well, that's one we should check out later. Like I remember flashes of Flubber, but like I, I never really paid much attention to it when it was on. Flashes <laughs> of Flubber. That sounds like a rejected title for a Game of Thrones book. <laughs> a flash of Flubber. <laughs> uh, also, what was the point of the villain? Well, he was your like high school douche. Wasn't he? But nobody seemed to particularly respect him or pay him any mind. No, not really. He was just being mean to Sean Astin. Yeah. Like, you know, he had his two cronies that helped staple him to a wall. Crab and oil, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And... Those staples would never hold a man up. Yeah, I know. He should be flat on his face. I guess no one particularly likes him, but he's, you know, he's one of those that nobody wants to... uh, Deal um, with. Cross or deal with, yeah. And uh, then Brendan Fraser comes along and changes the dynamic a bit. I mean, the scene at the end, which I think is meant to be like the dramatic climax of the movie, where he investigates and see no man and discovers that he's a caveman, and then he unveils that in front of the whole prom. Well, he just says he's a caveman, and I guess they think they get, he's giving him a nickname and they cheer. <laughs> yeah, but. What? Why did he think that would do anything? Yeah, I mean, who does? It, firstly, who does he think would believe him? Secondly, yeah. even with the pictures, I mean, I know it's only the early nineties, but it's pretty. It would have been possible to like stage Polaroids, <laughs> so you know that would be the logical assumption. Also, why would being a caveman harm his popularity? In the world of this movie, where you can apparently balance a car on two wheels Brilliant. for an extended period of time and getting caught doing so gets you in the cells for a night. I think it's more the fact that they stole it. Yeah. Than the fact that well, they didn't eat treats in the it. universe where stealing a car gets you a night in the cells and a slap on the wrist and no more. <laughs> <laughs> White privilege, am I right? Like a person being a caveman thawed out, I think could probably be Socially survivable, let's say. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he had nothing to achieve in that scene. Also, he no. broke into Sean Astin's house, as in he did it very quietly in order to steal the photos, and then he made a lot of noise on the way out and made it abundantly clear that he was robbing them, and also he parked his car in their front garden. I know that Sean Astin... Probably wouldn't be able to do anything about that, but surely his parents would notice or do something about it. Like, yeah, like why, is have... strange... <laughs> why is there this strange car parked in our driveway? Evidence of breaking and entering. Like, I mean, even if Link being a caveman was a crime, the evidence <laughs> was obtained illegally and therefore is not admissible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we're overthinking it. <laughs> we are, but it's so funny to do. <laughs> oh. But imagine breaking in somebody's house and parking in their <laughs> driveway. <laughs> what were you doing? Yeah. Here? Well, I don't need to get a, do a quick getaway, but <laughs> I mean, at least park a bit down the block. Yeah, like what if like, what if like the parents arrived, saw there was a car park there, and parked in front of it? Yeah, I mean, what would you do? <laughs> also, why were the other two guys there? 
No, I mean, getaway driver, maybe? <laughs> yeah, but you only need one of those. The other guy was chopped liver. Guess he just didn't want to be left out. <laughs> also, the whole romantic love triangle thing where she's like, oh yeah, I like uh, Link because he's fun and, well, I suppose that'd be a love uh, rectangle. I'm not sure that, um, wasn't it, Robin's interest in Link was romantic. Neither do I. I think it was just like, because he was the best option to take. Well, I think it was just because he was fun. Yeah. And she wanted to go with someone who was fun. Do you know what? That's a really good reason to go to the prom with somebody, actually. Props to this movie. Yeah. And I, I don't think she had any romantic designs on him. She just wanted to have a good time with someone. Yeah. And I think part of that was like, you know, get your shit together, start having more fun, and then I'll go with you, sort of thing. Yeah. Which was good, but I like how she just decided that she wants to be with Sean Astin instead off screen, like. <laughs> you made a couple of Avatar The Last Airbender references when we were watching. This movie was very similar. Think about it. You had. Um... It's not very similar, it has a couple of very similar story <laughs> beats. <laughs> Well, you've got, like, the two characters who are practically siblings. You know, you've got Sean Astin and Paulie Shaw, who are Katara and um, Sokka, respectively. Find this... Who's who? Uh, well, no, um, Katara's more serious, so she'd be Sean Astin. And Sokka <laughs> would be Paulie Shaw, because they're both amusing and, at times, slightly annoying. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And they find this boy in the iceberg... Uh, he gets thawed out, and they have to re ingratiate him to society. And he, there's an emotional... Well, I think it's meant to be an emotional scene at the museum where it dawns where, on him. That, where he finds out what happened to him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose that was meant to be the most emotional scene of the movie, but it was sort of glossed over. Yeah. It happened, yeah. and then it was unimportant. He just got over it. Yeah. Bit of a shock, but then he was fine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this movie's actually quite realistic in one regard. I think that if somebody ended up in another time when they couldn't speak the language of a people, the first thing they'd do is try and mimic everything. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually kind of uh, realistic. After screaming at a helicopter. Also, it's realistic. That, that was a funny scene, especially out of context. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, considering this movie took place in like the space of a few days, that kind of makes sense that he wouldn't speak fluent English by the end of the movie, because why would you? That'd probably take yeah. months. Yeah. He just uh, picked up a few phrases. Yeah. <laughs> Among them, wheeze the juice. That was a good scene. I liked that. That was yeah. amusing. That one scene with Eric Avari in it. No wheezing the juice. <laughs> Without knowing what people think of this movie, I'd imagine that would be the iconic scene that people remember. Well, it was the one I remembered. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and hey, Eric Avari got a very pivotal role. The guy behind the <laughs> counter. He, the the Seven Eleven cashier, the yeah. The Seven Eleven cashier. It's that unforgettable role that landed him his role in Home Alone Four, <laughs> <laughs> and being Chandra Suresh in Heroes, of course. He's good, is Eric Avari. <laughs> I like him. I'd like to see him in more movies. He's just so yeah. versatile as it's well. It's fun to see him pop up in places. <laughs> yeah, I've talked about this before. I've said it once. I'll say it again. He's very versatile. He could play a lot of different roles. Yeah. Well, he has. Yeah, proven it. So, Ollie, how well did the film achieve its goals? And what were they? I don't know, and I don't know. <laughs> well, I've done uh, a bit of reading like... about this. It was a, a time when uh, a lot of movies weren't necessarily geared towards teenagers so much. And you had Wayne's World shortly before, which was a very successful movie that was... Uh, aimed very heavily at uh, teen demographics, and that inspired yeah. them to make this movie directly targeted at that demographic. Yeah, you can see where there'd be a few Wayne's World vibes in this, yeah. Yeah, I feel like this movie would be very popular with teenagers from the early 90s America, and probably no one else, but there was enough <laughs> of a niche at the time that it did well. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it was quite successful at that. It did quite well for a more niche movie. Yeah. I don't know how well it did in the UK. It seems like a movie that would be mostly popular in America because all the confectionery references, a lot of the language probably wouldn't be heard outside of America, 
And by that, I mean like the slang that the characters use. I don't know if some of those are poorly sure I mean, or... It was on TV a fair bit. But, you know what I mean? People don't exactly go around saying poorly sure things, do they? No. And they probably didn't back then, maybe outside of actual California, perhaps? So a lot of those phrases are very uh, dated to its time, and I don't know how many of them were made up by Paulie Shaw himself. Yeah. Yeah, and do you know what? I didn't find him annoying. For some reason, Paulie Shaw is one of those comedians who's got a reputation for being quite irritating. Yeah, I can see why, but um, no, I, I don't think he crosses that threshold in this movie. No, I think, that th- from what I understand, there are later movies where he definitely does cross that threshold and it kind of ruined his reputation with a lot of people. Right. But no, he was fine in this. Uh, this movie wasn't really irritating. No, no. And it very easily could have been, to be honest. To appeal to a teen demographic. To protect the world from devastation. And sort of uh, emulate the appeal of Wayne's World was one of the goals, <laughs> right? I mean, you can definitely tell that with like the way that popular music, um, games, consoles, arcade games were used in this film. Yeah, there's a lot of licensed music in this film. Yeah, and it had its obligatory I'm Too Sexy montage where I'm Too Sexy for My Shirt plays yeah, while when he's they're... making himself over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was also the foreshadowing where he's playing the driving arcade game by Sega, uh, very heavily yeah. shown. That foreshadows when he steals the car later. Yeah. <laughs> and um, parks it more or less perfectly, albeit with flat tyres. I feel like Brendan Fraser was almost wasted in this movie in a way. Yeah, I can see what you mean. Obviously, he gets very little dialogue, for obvious reasons. He he plays the role good enough. Yeah, he's kind of a one-note character by design. Obviously, he's managed to demonstrate his range a lot better in later movies, as we yeah. talked about last week. But it's quite interesting that this would have been one of his earliest roles, and obviously it was good enough for his potential to seep through and impress people. You could see this as his audition for George of the Jungle, really. Yeah, because there's a lot of Georgisms in there, you know, when he's making the noises and the way he walks and all of that. Yeah. Did the movie exceed your expectations? Not really. No. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's what I expected it to be. <laughs> yeah, it's the same um. here. It's about what I thought we'd get. So it was a bit odder, a uh, bit more of a non sequitur than I was expecting, but. That's not necessarily to its detriment. I still thought it was funny. Yeah, yeah. It was still a fun time. Uh, it was about what I expected. I wasn't disappointed. I wasn't wowed yeah. either. I wasn't wowed. Like, you can see why a movie like Wayne's World would be a cult classic, but this movie, not so much. Like, I saw this when I was uh, when I was a kid, and I think that's the perfect time to see a film like this. Oh, yeah. Well, it's meant for young people. Yeah. I feel like there's not enough to keep you coming back, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's true. Because I... with Wayne's World, there's a lot of subtle jokes and background details that you don't notice on your first viewing, and the scenes are iconic enough to make you want to watch them over and over again. Whereas with this, there's not really anything other than the odd moments that you probably want to revisit at a later date. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, it's not timeless either, which makes a lot of sense, considering it's very much an early 90s movie that captures a spirit that, well, obviously doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. It probably did a good job of engendering that spirit at the time, though. So, would you say, though, that there's an element in the film that particularly appeals to you? Brendan Fraser, obviously. Yeah, we're just here to support him, aren't we? Yeah. Although he's got um, more work in the last few years than I thought he had. I looked it up. Oh, yeah. Although apparently he was uh, in that Titans as Robot Man. Robot Man? Yeah, that was his character's name. I don't know DC Comics that well. (laughs) It's always something man with this man, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know what? I don't think there's an element in this film that particularly appeals. Other than the obvious. (laughs) Like... And oh, also, it's always fun to see Sean Astin in things because, well, I can't help but see Samwise Gamgee to this day. 
Yeah, it was very intriguing to see him at such a young age, because I feel like this would have been one of his first movies. He looks very fresh-faced and, uh, you know, not saying he's aged horribly or anything, but uh, I-, I thought it was quite amusing that his teacher in this movie looks a lot like how he looks today. <laughs> Again, yeah. I'm not having a go at Sean Aston. I like him, he's brilliant, but I just thought that was funny. Him being taught by himself from the future. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was an interesting time capsule. So I wouldn't say that there's an element of a film that particularly appeals, but I'd say that there's elements that intrigue me. Yeah, yeah, I think I would agree with that. Particularly in how pointless the plot was as well. That That is just funny to me. Yeah, like, there's not much in the way of character arcs. The, the plot sort of happens around them. There's no real stakes. No, not really. It's just um spending some time with some people in a bizarre situation. It's a lot like going to an all-vegan waffle house. There's no real stakes. Huh. Yeah, because you know they're going to get together, like Sean Astin and the girl. You know that he's not going to get shot or killed or anything. Nothing like that's going to happen. But there's not even really any real scuffles other than that one where... In seeing a man gets pushed around a bit in the ice rink. Yeah, he gets punched in the face once and walks away. Yeah, I mean, the movie doesn't really escalate the tension in any way. It's just things happen, nobody well, really There gets is that hurt. one scuffle between Sean Astin and Polly Shaw when Sean Astin tries to send Link away. That was a weird scene because that was all one scene, right? He sends him away, Polly Shaw talks him out of it, and then they act like nothing ever happened. And this was all one scene. There was no scene where they spent a prolonged amount of time apart. It would be like if they did Return of the King when uh, Samwise Gamgee is sent away by Frodo and then he immediately comes back and says, wait, no, I'm not going away. I'm going to help you get to Mordor. Well, fair enough. Come along. It'd be like if that happened. I love the Lord of the Rings films, but I don't really care for that bit. I suppose we'll get to that. We'll get to that. I agree. It's like the dumbest scene in that movie, but we'll get yeah, to it. It's, it's get not to in it. the book, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you can tell, can't you? <laughs> yeah. How does the film hold up today? Uh, I don't think it really like. It doesn't, does it? <laughs> not really. <laughs> like, not as a contemporary piece of media. It's very of its time, and um. The caveman's still a laugh, but other than that, there's very little in this film to appeal to the modern day audience. Well, the audience has grown out of it, as in the intended audience. Yeah. It's got no timeless qualities. It's an interesting time capsule. Yeah, I was just about to call it that. (laughs) Uh So it's not like it has no value. I'm I'm not having a go here. Yeah. It's just all right. Yeah. Yeah. This movie does no harm by existing. It's not like it promotes anything harmful or scary in any way. It just exists. Pretty much. Was the film received appropriately at the time? I have no idea, was it? I think so. Just doing a bit of research. It was quite popular in its time. It opened up 5th in the UK, actually, September 1992. Which is quite interesting, considering it was definitely made for American audiences. Yeah. It made um, very interesting. It made forty million at the North American box office. There's occasionally some pretty good shot composition in here, but it's like, sorry, going back to whether or not there's stuff that appeals. There's the occasional really good shot, but there's like two or three of them throughout the entire movie. The movie does some competent juxtaposition, like when he's being hung up by the staples. You can see a crown behind him when he previously expressed he wants to be the prom king. Yeah, the caveman standing in the pool. The mammoth in the background, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, so it's got its detail, but it doesn't do anything groundbreaking. No, it was Sean Astin standing in the pool with the shovel. Well, yeah, he would be, wouldn't he? Yeah. Also, the pool is completed by the end of the movie, which is an interesting touch. Yeah, yeah. Apparently they found time to do that. Apparently they found time to do that. They f- apparently found time to do a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, it's weird that they live in a moderately wealthy uh, neighbourhood, yet he's digging out his own pool. Well, maybe that's where all the money goes, is the house upkeep. Yeah, and it, it means just a bit of a cheap ass. 
Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, that's why he wheezes the juice. It's not just for the uh, thrill of it. It's because he is frugal. He yeah. doesn't want to pay for it. <laughs> just wheeze the juice. No wheeze for the juice. No, no wheezing, wheezing the, juice. the juice. It, it did well at the time. Uh, let me see what the title box office was. Yeah, 7 million budget, 40.7 million box office. So it made money. Yeah, cool. You know, tell me, friend, uh, can you ask for anything more? Nah. <laughs> also, all the actors who were in this went on to bigger and better things afterwards, so that, yeah. again, is a positive. You could argue that it launched a few careers, maybe? It's got a very low approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, though. I, I, I'm not surprised. What is it, and yeah, what does okay. the consensus say? Critic score is 15%, but 3.4 out of 10 average rating. Right. I'm not really surprised. Narratively, it's not very good. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's dross yeah, from a narrative ju- standpoint. <laughs> if you're judging it by that um, metric, yeah. you're not going to get a good... But yeah, it's like the uh, dross of um, uh, Sean Astin's career and underneath is the molten aluminium that is the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the audience score, however, is a bit more... Uh, forgiving? Yeah, forgiving. 56%. Yeah, it seems about right. Uh, what movie were we reviewing that was lower than 56% recently? Well, let's see. The, the last one was The Mummy Returns. Before that, it was Bedazzled. Yeah, it's got a higher audience score than Bedazzled, interestingly enough. E- even though, by far, I would consider Bedazzled to be the superior movie of the two. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> so I assume it just has its small but very supportive band of loyal fans who watched it at the time and have sentimentality for it. Yeah, yeah. That feels about right. Uh, The critics' consensus reads, Encino Man isn't the first unabashedly silly comedy to embrace its stupidity and a massive court following, but whether or not it works for you will largely be determined by your tolerance for Paulie Shaw. I mean, that's a point. He is a big part of this movie, but... He's not that big, though, is he? He's like... Like I wouldn't even call him the second main character. He's the third one. Do movies like this really have comic relief characters? Surely everybody's comic relief. Well, Paulie Shaw is the comic relief character, but yeah, because c- Sean Astin is driving the plot. Yeah, he's a straight man. So Paulie Shaw kind of has to be. But then we've got Brendan Fraser as the caveman being the sort of... Thing that happens to them. Yeah, the inciting incident. In every situation, I would say. Yeah, I agree. He is the inciting instance of this movie. Yeah, and pretty much every situation they get into because of that. <laughs> He's also the MacGuffin of the movie, in a way. Yeah, yeah. Also, they do do Chekhov's cake in this one, but they don't go the whole hog. What? It, it's not really set up, so it's not Chekhov's cake. It's, it's just, just cake. a cake. It's just cake. Because you've got the bully who falls into the cake. It was him, wasn't it? Yeah. I only watched it 20 minutes ago. Yeah, it was the bully that falls into the cake, but you never have any setup. Like, you don't have them standing by the cake early going, oh, that's an amazing looking cake you've made there, or anything like that. You can't do the joke where the guy falls into the cake unless you set up how valuable or amazing the cake is before it's wrecked. <laughs> Such a missed opportunity. You could have had uh, Paulie Shaw and um, Sean Astin saying, oh, wow, that's one hell of a cake right there, buddy. And you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> waste. Waste of a cake. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So, yeah, uh, I think the film was received appropriately at the time. Now it's obviously judged by its merits as a movie in 2021, and it, obviously it's being judged quite poorly, which is understandable. It's going to get by on nostalgia for people who uh, saw it when they were kids, like me. <laughs> if it made teenagers in the early 90s happy, then it served its role and, yeah, it did achieve its goals if it did that. Seems to have done. Seems to have done. The thing is, though, critics will appraise a film on whether or not it works as a piece of cinema, whereas audiences are much more likely to be, did I have a good time? To be honest, for that reason, I generally do agree with the audiences a bit more, just because I think they're judging it by their own metric, which is a bit fairer and more widely encompassing. Well, it's less scrutinous. Yeah. 
And scrutiny is good, but scrutiny for the sake of scrutiny just isn't my kind of journalism. It just isn't my kind of criticism. Well, uh, it can be mine, but, you know, whether or not something works as a piece of cinema isn't going to stop me from enjoying it if I'm having a good time. All right. So would you like to sum up, Ollie? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, so, Encino Man is not a great piece of cinema, or even a particularly good one, but it's a fun nostalgia trip if you were of a certain age. It's a perfectly serviceable way to kill an hour and a half. That's basically what I think of it. Well, it's an hour and a half long. There's no harm in watching it. You might enjoy it, but if you've got anything even mildly important to do, like, I don't know, tidying up your room or cleaning your toenails, do that instead. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, so what do we have next week? I believe next week we've got the very last of the Potterses. Yeah, we're going to do those back to back, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so expect them to release very close to each other, but we are doing Definitely Hallows Part 1 and 2 together, but as separate videos because we tried and we couldn't really sit through four hours of a Harry Potter movie in one sitting. No. It's just a bit too much. I mean, we needed a bit of a break in between, so we did them as two separate videos in the end. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I hope you've been enjoying Fraser February, uh, despite it being March. Yeah. At time of recording, who the hell knows when it will be when this video goes up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, March begins with a letter M, so you can't really say uh, Fraser March, can you? Fraser February has to be because it's illiterate. I mean, we could have made it Fraser Fridays and uploaded these as extra videos on Friday, but why that would have been more work. Why did we not think of that? Yeah, why did we not think of that? Oh well, we, we are where we are. See you next week for Harry Potter. We hope you enjoyed our review of Encino Man. Yeah, we'll see you next week. See you next week. Goodbye. Subscribe, share, everything. All of that, yes. Um, <laughs> please. See you yeah. next week.